45 minutes, leaving some time for questions and answers, we're going to cover a case study um, by Mayo Clinic. Um, really, we will be t discussing Mayo Clinic's experience with Global Edge, um, specifically around uh, payment, reducing payment costs and vendor compliance. Um, as far as your speakers today, my name is Jay Cherry. I am the president and co-founder of the company. Uh, over my 25-year career, I have worked in the financial services space, predominantly focusing on risk management, uh, addressing strategies to reduce risk, and building processes that uh, result in cost-effective measures, uh, specifically in, in addressing risk. Um, I'd like to now introduce Eric Henneke of Mayo Clinic. Thanks, Jane. Just a quick reminder to share your screen with attendees so they can see our smiling faces. My name is Eric Henneke. I work for Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'm senior manager for um, vendor, vendor supply risk and um, audit control functions and also financial functions specifically for supply chain management inside of Mayo Clinic. Um, been with the organization about seven years. Almost all of that time we've worked with Global Edge and its partners in um, in partnership for auto recovery services and other types of um, um, risk reduction services, a couple of which will t or one of which we'll talk about on today's webinar. But before we uh, we dive into some of the content that we've prepared for this webinar, I wanted to share a, a, a brief story of uh, of something that we. Um, did at Mayo Clinic, and it sort of leads nicely into the specific products uh, that we're, we'll be talking about in further depth today. About five or so years ago, um, I it was a couple of years after I'd come into Mayo and, and come into supply chain. Um, I was one of my responsibilities coming in was management of um, audit control risk functions around accounts payable, and, and of course one of those one of those risks that feeds into the accounts payable process is the vendor master. And after, after some time studying our internal processes on how we manage the vendor master, we, um, I guess I, I became concerned with some of, the, you know, some of the segregation of duties and some of the risks that, at least in my mind, were present in terms of setting up and, and, and changing vendors in the system. And so, one day I approached our supply chain leadership group and I said, you know, I asked the question first, you know, how easy or how hard do you think it would be for me, you know, understanding a little bit about how AP works in the organization and a little bit about how Vendor Master works, for me to set myself up as a vendor and pass through payments and pay myself. You know, and of course it would be not for legitimate products and services, but just you know for 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 nothing, just just to see if I could pay myself. And the answer I got was a pretty definitive that wouldn't be possible inside of our current control structure. And I said, well, if that's the case, then will you know you let me try to see if I if I can do it, just you know t just to test the controls, if you will. And the response I got was, uh, well, sure, I suppose you could. Could do that, and it was a bit of a nervous, you know, response. And so, I, between myself and, and one of my my colleagues, we we did just that. Um, we established our basically three companies inside of uh, the vendor master at Mail, and we did it in three different ways. One was a brand new vendor who had never previously existed, and two were existing vendors in our vendor master that we just modified, and you know, went about the process of actually setting up a lockbox right down the street from my office and, and went to the bank and set up a business bank account and so forth. But, you know, really kind of did it front to end. And over the next three months, then passed through the accounts payable and vendoring process 15 invoices for those three companies. And <clears throat> at the end of the testing period, what ended up happening was we received 14 of 15 payments, um, albeit check. And the one, the one check or the one payment request that we didn't receive was actually supposed to be a wire. It was for a million dollars. It was the big one of the 15. And the reason that we didn't get that payment was sort of 
luck, and it was a, a one person who processes the wires for, for supply chain at Mayo, and she was doing the wires that day, noticed the, you know, the invoice, and, and thought it was a bit odd that we were, you know, that somebody was asking for a million dollar wire payment for a product that wasn't on a purchase order, and, you know, took 10 seconds to question it, but really, um, at the end of the day, said to me, you know, as we were kind of wrapping up the review, it was sort of just stupid luck that I happened to notice I was really busy. It would have been very easy for me to just ignore it. And so um, we ended up with 14 checks, about a quarter million dollars in hand when we were done with that project. So it, it brought to light very quickly some of the gaps that we had in our processes, specifically around vendoring. And that's really where we're headed today with this conversation in large part is accounts payable and vendor master, how we manage that risk. Well, Eric, I appreciate your transparency in sharing that story with, uh, with the folks on the webinar. Uh, I will tell you, Global Edge has been the audit company for Mayo Clinic since 2005, I believe it is. And uh, over that period, you know, we built a strong relationship. But even following the test that Eric just described, they still went through a, an RFP process to determine how they would address the issues uh, of letting vendors get into the vendor master file that had not properly been vetted. Um, so, so what Mayo did is they did an RFP, and Global Edge uh, uh, responded to that RFP. And because of our background in risk and risk management, I actually began a journey of, of building uh, the suite of products, which, which is uh, vendor links for Global Edge that addresses supplier onboarding, regulatory compliance, as well as just vendor management and vendor risk. Because of the relationship that we've had with Mayo and our um, you know, collaboration in building the products, I want to be very transparent in saying that you know, Mayo has allowed Global Edge unprecedented access to their supply chain processes. Um, and allowed us to help build these technologies within the Mayo Clinic infrastructure. Uh, for that, there is a, a royalty arrangement in place, so I want to make sure that we're, we're very transparent in that regard um, with respect to how we have built out this technology. Um, today, I'll also add that Mayo Clinic ranks number two in Gartner's best supply chain uh, for healthcare. So where we've come from um, with Mayo Clinic when Eric did the test, where they are today, I, I think is, is a very different, uh, it's been a tremendous progress. I, I think you would agree with that, Eric. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of the learning objectives, Eric, can you, can you go through the, the areas we're going to cover today as we get Absolutely. started? Absolutely. So the, the three bullet points laid out in front of you really is where we're headed with the next, you know, 45 or so minutes. and. Really, we want to emphasize, and hopefully my story you know, provided some kind of background in, in terms of the total risk of, uh, in, uh, of having vendors in your vendor master and, and placing payments to vendors. So really, we want to talk about the reason that authentication is such an important thing to consider doing inside your organizations. And then along with that, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure these days, whether you're in healthcare like us or really any other sector, that um, we're, we're trying to reduce those administrative costs and drive out waste. And, and so along with balancing the, the, the reduction of risk, we hope, um, there's also a lot, of, a lot of appetite out there for reduction of payment costs, processing costs. So we'll talk uh, quite a bit about that as well. And then ultimately driving uh, both vendor compliance and cost reduction toward uh, ensuring regu regulatory compliance, and, and that again is very important, not just for us in healthcare, but everybody has their own set of rules that they have to abide by, and, and so, uh, you know, getting at that regulatory compliance. So a little bit about Mayo Clinic, uh, and some, some of you may be familiar with us, others perhaps not. Uh, we're a charitable, not-for-profit academic medical center. We have uh, three main core, what we call the male group practice campuses. Uh, I reside at the flagship in Rochester, Minnesota, but we also have two significant campuses in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Jacksonville, Florida. <clears throat> and then for those, um, for those who may be living in the upper Midwest, we also have uh, quite a few hospitals uh, that we call our health systems which are uh, smaller 
um, primarily acute care type of hospitals located in the upper Midwest vicinity, southeast Minnesota, um, into Wisconsin and northeast Iowa. We do uh, provide care for over a million patients annually, and uh, most of those are face-to-face, -face, but of course uh, a lot of institutions now are getting into the telemedicine, and, and Mayo is, is um, in that boat as well. About just under $9 billion in revenue will probably hit nine this year. Uh, and quite a few physicians and scientists, of course, because uh, not only are we a hospital, but also a medical, a medical educational institution, and also um, we get involved in the research component as well. So really a three-pronged ap approach in terms of practice education and research. Um, and I think we're probably closer to 60, 362,000 employees now, most of those in Rochester, at least half of those in Rochester, Minnesota, um, and meds just under 3,500. So just taking a step back, it's kind of as a, um, a, a pass through time, if you will, um, as I alluded to before, we had a lot of reason to, uh, to have interest in some, in at least a vendor authentication type of, of product based upon our, our, um, our testing that we had done internally. But there were other types of things when, when we went out for an RFP, which Shay had mentioned, when we went out for an RFP, we were seeking not only vendor authentication types of services, but other types of services as well. And most of those services we actually had already, it was just that we were we were doing business with a lot of disparate vendors that were providing us a very specific service and at, at, I would say a moderate to high cost per, uh, per vendor relationship. And so we were really out there looking for that holistic approach where um, we could you know, not only validate vendors, which was kind of the, the, the lead in terms of what we were looking for, but also getting into that, that compliance around tax IDs and 1099 reporting, um, making sure that we were in compliance with any type of regulatory requirements. And so, um, so for, for Mayo and for the healthcare realm, we were looking at, you know, were, were we doing business with somebody on the OFAC list or a principal on the OFAC list, um, you know, highly prohibited in our industry and as well as others. So we really wanted to be sure we were doing the right we were doing business with the right people. Um, we were looking ag again at the um, reduction of fraud and waste and, and anything like, like that inside of our accounts payable process. And then you know, ultimately driving toward those manual processes which we hoped and assumed would drive down operating costs and in fact did um, and reduce uh, any risks of fraud as well. And we also have a small interest in uh, tracking minority, uh, minority spend. Uh, it's a, a Board of Governors um, initiative and so we internally wanted to be able to track that spend also. That's great, Eric. Thank you. So given, given the considerations that Mayo had with respect to vendor management, Global Edge, uh, you know, we've, we've built a process today which has been in the market for a number of years. But essentially, everything around vendor management again begins with authentication. We uh, ensuring that you're doing business with a legitimate, financially stable organization is key. As Eric alluded to in the beginning, um, if you don't have a process to vet vendors appropriately, you're putting your organization at risk. The, the way the process uh, works today uh, in, in order to stop uh, a vendor from getting into the vendor master file is Mayo Clinic actually has a link on their website where new vendors, whether it's a solicitation vendor, an RFP vendor, doesn't really matter. They're going to go through the website and they're going to uh, they're going to request to to be a vendor for, or a supplier for Mayo. When they make that request, they get a reference ID sent to them in the form of an invitation, and these invitations can be customized based on. Uh, how the vendor, uh, you know, completes the completes uh, or, or the path they take uh, through, through the website. But what it does is it begins a four-step, excuse me, a three-step process where the supplier goes into a portal, and starts giving business details, uh, and, and capturing the things necessary for Global Edge to start authentication to determine are they legitimate or are they not. That process itself, as I said, it, it is set up as three three steps. Uh, we ask the supplier to to give us all the business details necessary for us to screen them, so to speak, 
you know, we're checking things such as financial stability. Um, we're checking things which uh, linking the owner to the business itself. The business details we're also classifying are they public or private. Uh, capturing the tax ID, and by capturing that tax ID, we have a process that will go to the IRS and validate that it does in fact ma match the business. Additionally, we are building um, a, an electronic W9 within the platform, which of course protects uh, Mayo Clinic from penalties or fines related to 1099s. Uh, we are asking the supplier: Are they a nonprofit, or are they a uh, what type of business from a minority standpoint. When we capture that, we also ask them for the certificate and, and Global Edge will validate that certificate. Um, again, all these are attempts just to ensure that uh, the supplier is legitimate and the information that they provide is accurate. As the supplier begins to approach the, the end of the registration process, in that invitation, uh, Mayo Clinic has the ability to, to define whether or not they would like to collect uh, uh, banking details. Uh, this is a customizable feature they can ask for, they cannot ask for it. But the, the, the objective, when we're looking at a, uh, at a vendor master file, be it Mayo Clinic or any other client, our goal is to, to scrutinize that file and, and in terms of how, how are you paying your bills? And is there more a more cost-effective way? Uh, and Eric will talk about some of, the, some of the results as we get later into this, but the, you know, we're looking to say, are, are you paying by check? Um, are, do you have vendors that, that Global Edge already knows would uh, would be would consider a procurement card, or is there a way to pay them through EFT or some other ACH type uh, transaction? Um, interestingly enough, about seventy percent of the suppliers that come to the platform you know, have banking information and banking details to Global Edge. Now that's a strong indication of their willingness to to take an alternative payment method. Um, it's important because you know we have clients who save as much as forty thousand or more dollars a month just through the collection of the banking information through registration, and being able to do away with the costs associated with a check, and put those costs you know reduce it down to literally pennies to pay in electronic format. Um, this service uh, by collecting that it's it's very powerful and the savings can be uh, relatively high depending on what your uh, transaction volume is. The other thing that we do um, when we go through the authentication process is we collect we collect documents. Uh, I go back to the invitation that we talked about. That invitation has the ability to uh, to define what documents are required um, to be validated. Let's say you want proof of general liability uh, of insurance, or you want a Secretary of State document uploaded. Um, the client has the ability to put those into the platform, uh, and then Global Edge will do the validation of those documents. The, the registration also is, it checks risk. So there are 40 checks um, that, there's 42 or so checks that we do, that even screens initially, is this supplier legitimate, or are, is there some indicator that suggests it's not even a real business? Uh, for example, uh, we get information, this is where, given the test Eric described, the process would have stopped. We, we, we have a risk indicator that tells us, this, has the business established a footprint, so to speak, and uh, meaning how they transacted publicly in a three-year window of time, uh, such as how they pay taxes, how they borrowed money, how they filed documents, such as um, corporation rules, et cetera. If we can't find anything, any evidence that they have existed in that three-year window, we put those into a into a risk bucket and global aspects those uh, uh, vendors even at a more deep level. And that's why you see here that you know we may start requesting information to further validate those companies. Eric created a company that was only days old. That company would have had a challenge getting to our platform because clearly many risky indicators would have come back on that on that organization, and it would have been put into a risk bucket. For global edge to that, Eric. Given the things we've covered relative to authentication, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, there is. There's a. I think this. This actually, this screen is really, really key and critical. In that, you know, in in our old world, kind of pre vendor authentication, and and I would guess most AP worlds today, you know, the 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 process of manage setting up and managing the vendor at the best is usually highly manual with a lot of paper. And the nice thing about the, the way that the, the vendor authentication tool is set up, 
you now have an automatic place to, uh, to, to archive and manage those documents in, in a one-stop shop. So instead of you know, going to the file cabinet, which while that sounds kind of funny, I still think a lot of shops do, even big ones. We used to before this, before this tool. Um, now it's all right here. And to Jay's point, what, what we can do then is start to assess the true risk of a vendor in looking at what does the external data tell us and how do the, the documents that the vendor provide either make it better or worse? I mean, in some cases, it makes it worse. But it at least gives the vendor an opportunity to explain at some level and with, you know, with documentation why it is that risks surface you know, with the external data that's being provided. And again, it gives you an opportunity as the client then to have those documents available at any point in time. So for example, you know, we collect W9s for all of our vendors, and that's just a, an internal requirement of ours. The problem with that is, where do you put all those paper documents or electronic documents outside of having a product or tool like this that, that you, can, you, know, you can do that and put it at the vendor level? So that's been particularly helpful think to us in that we, we now have that archive uh, ability and we don't have to dig around in a file cabinet anymore. Thank you, Eric. In, in, in addition, um, you know, I've, I've already spoken to many of these things, but as we capture the business details, those also are recorded and put into a central vendor location, um, which GlobalS can use to match back against the, the, the vendor master file to ensure it's not a duplicate vendor. And in fact, when the supplier registers into the platform, uh, you, you don't want duplication. So one of the checks that we do initially is, in the vendor master file, does that vendor already exist? Because obviously a, a, you know, a cloudy vendor master file creates all kinds of downstream issues. You know, I've talked about some of the things that are listed here. We did the W9 creation. Um, you know, for the vendor, the vendor benefit is once they've done that, it can be repurposed to, uh, against other clients as well. So it's a benefit to the vendor too. Um, the IRS 10 matching, uh, what a lot of folks don't know is that the IRS has about nine different indicators relative to a tax ID. Uh, you know, the simplest is does it match the company, yes or no. If it doesn't, we also get detail back. Uh, as to why it's a mismatch. Uh, perhaps it doesn't exist at all. Perhaps it, it, it matches a different company. Uh, all of these things are, you know, have uh, purpose and, and it drives the way we treat the vendor relative to our requirements for that supplier. We do over 100 federal sanction checks as well. So, um, you, you know, the, the government uh, after 9-11, the terrorist attacks, I know a lot of people know about this, but um, you not only need to check the business, but you need to check the owner if they have greater than 5% ownership in the company. What separates our process, uh, we believe at least, is that we are placing a, a supplier on a, on, a, on a batch list where every night we go and we check every one of the lists uh, around the globe, uh, including GSA, the OFAC, OIG, uh, et cetera. Um, but these include international lists. This is the World Banking list, um, you know, the European list, the Canadian list, um, literally around the globe. But we do this every day. And if there is a hit uh, or a potential match, our, our technology actually alerts Mail that you have a potential uh, match, and we give them a, a tool within our vendor list platform where they actually can manage that exception, document their path to get it resolved. Uh, if they get a letter of attestation, it's archived within the platform. So if there are ever um, any issues that arise from that potential hit, they've got records to, to demonstrate they've managed appropriately. I've already talked about the, the risk factors and the risk checks that are performed. Those checks are um, systemic. We go out to several different data providers and bring in public information on each supplier that registers in the platform. Um, financial stability is one. We're predicting the forward-looking viability of the organization over a 12-month period. Um, if you're doing an RFP, for example, and you have an invitation that's specific to that uh, project, you know the last thing you want to do is enter a contract with a company that uh, likely may not even be in business in 12 months. So um, this is just some of the things that we're checking. We've talked about uh, minority uh, certificates and certification uh, and the document validation uh, as well. 
So these are the things that VendorLinks does uh, uh, systemically uh, for Mayo Clinic in a proactive fashion. We, we like to think um, uh, for Mayo, we, we're, we're somewhat of a gateway. So if you want to do business, you're going to go through, you're going to go through this vetting process, and by the time they get to Mayo, Mayo can have confidence that they're doing business with a, with a good supplier. Um, interestingly enough, just uh, about two weeks ago, um, Mayo had a supplier that wanted to do business with them, and uh, they went in and put in bad data just to demonstrate, uh, I think, that they could get through, and uh, they were they were stopped. And you know, we reached out to the supplier, uh, and uh, you know, I'm not sure if they believed or not in the in the technology and how it would protect Mayo, but you know, they 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 said they just wanted to understand the controls and if they actually worked. And they did. So we're, we're very pleased that uh, you know we're taking care of the problems that Eric spoke of early as we started the process. With that, Eric, I, I thought we would talk about your experience and, and some of the things in the case, you know, as, as a result of this case study, uh, some of the benefits that you've had using the Global Edge technology and how it's uh, per, you know done a few things. One, protected you from risk perspective, but also reduced your costs associated with how you pay your suppliers. Sounds great, Jay. Okay. Let's talk about risk mitigation first. Sure. So um, there's w when you're looking at the total opportunity for cost savings, there there are a couple of ways that you a couple of things you you would kind of add together in consideration of you know, your total your total savings. And, and so the first one, the first cost to consider is risk mitigation. And, and so on this slide, you see. It shows you some statistics for Mayo Clinic in terms of, you know, how many vendors that we've reviewed through our processes, Global Edges technology, you know, what what all of that, kind of all the statistics that underline um, those approximately 2,000 vendors. And what you notice is that um, there's a fair number of, of vendors, you know, out of the 2,000 approximately that we did remove or um, or for whatever reason, made a decision not to do business with in the future. Now, <clears throat> I get asked quite often in in forums like this when you know when, when we're talking about true cost reduction or cost savings for reduction of risk. You know, how do you measure measure such uh, a number? And the answer is it's really really tough to do. The problem that that you run into in calculating a savings number is that you really don't know the dollars that have been saved as a result of doing vendor authentication efforts. So let, let me give you an example. Let's say that we have a vendor um, that, that Mayo decided that they weren't going to do business with anymore. And let's say that in the past you know, 12 months we've paid that vendor $20,000. And let's say that as the vendor authentication process continued with that vendor, they made a they made a a decision that they weren't going to participate. And, and let's assume that it's because they were a shell company doing business for uh, for no reason other than just to collect monies for for not actually performing any services. Now, often what happens in those situations is as Global Edge and this mail gets closer to the reality of the vendor, so closer closer to the truth in what the vendor is actually doing. A lot of times, that vendor will just kind of disappear and choose not to participate anymore. And at that point, Mayo would probably make then make the leap that um, this isn't a, a vendor we want to do business with anymore. The problem is that a lot of times we don't know because those vendors do tend to just kind of disappear into thin air. Sometimes we don't know truly what happened with the vendor. It could just be that they went out of business uh, for a legitimate reason, a bankruptcy or something like that. And so it's hard to attach a number to a specific vendor that we no longer do business with. About all you can do is is just consider that um, the you know, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners says that about 5% of your revenues are lost to fraud in a year. And that's kind of across all industries. So if you if you think about that, if you take your your own revenue number, you multiply it by five percent. That's approximately how much fraud exists in your organization, and a subset of that is likely leaking out through the vendor authentication process. 
So it's a little bit difficult to attach an actual savings here, but we know that there are some dollars that are saved in no longer doing business with not only illegitimate vendors, but vendors that pose a risk to us, whether it be a fraud risk, a financial risk, et cetera. Jay talked about you know, the vendor who um, is participating in an RFP, but in six months may not be in business anymore. There's a cost to doing business with that vendor if, in fact, they do go insolvent in the next six months. And so you have to consider all of those hard and soft savings when you think about a risk mitigation savings number. And one thing I would add to that, Eric, is the 1.6% who have been escalated. Um, Global FCs, uh, that number is consistent across any client that we have. So, so a good rule of thumb is um, you know, acknowledge and recognize the 5% according to the ACFE. But we can tell you statistically 1.6% uh, if you take your vendor file times that number, those are likely the vendors, uh, if you went through a thorough vetting process, that for one reason or another, be it they're fraudulent, out of business, et cetera, you would likely end or suspend the relationship with those suppliers. Um, and, and generally that works out to be a fairly substantial number. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, while, while we have this blank here, because it's really more of an exercise for you to think about your own environment, um, you know, we've seen anywhere from 350000 to greater than a million dollar savings from, from uh, I say a savings for, uh, should be characterized as mitigation of risk for, for clients. So it can be substantial. Next we'll talk about check cost, Eric, and savings associated with that. Absolutely. So, so Jay showed a, a slide earlier, <clears throat> and it showed you, you know, where, where the vendor has an opportunity to enter bank information into the into the system. And that's a really, really key, I think a really key area of the vendor authentication process because outside of, you know, we talked earlier about we want to be able to reduce risk but also at the same time reduce cost. That's a really, really key step in cost reduction, at least from Mayo's perspective, in considering, um, you know, how we how do we take some of those administrative costs that exist almost exclusively inside the, the check processing process and force them into an electronic process instead that, as Jay alluded to, cost pennies on the dollar. And so oftentimes when, you know, when Jay or myself talk about this particular, um, this particular topic, and especially in a live audience, we will ask, you know, what is the what is the cost for your organization uh, to process a check? And the numbers vary greatly across organizations, and it, it also you know varies quite a bit in terms of what cost they load into that number. But most you know most industry standards are somewhere north of ten dollars per check, and, and a lot of a lot of benchmarking organizations is significantly more than that. But just for the purposes of demonstration, let's say it's ten dollars per check, and if you know, so if you consider, you know, taking um, a, a certain percent, even just twenty percent of your total spend, and converting it from checks to an EFT or ACH, you know, that's going to be almost a ten dollar per check savings. If you know, when you consider your cost of doing an ACH or EFT, so if you multiply approximately ten dollars times the number of checks that you're, you know, you're looking to drive out of, of your you know, own internal shop, that number adds up really, really fast. And so um, Mayo has been able to recognize you know, pretty significant savings in, in this bucket. And these aren't sort of squishy, soft savings. These are, are real, actual, you know, hard dollar savings that we can prove out. And again, there's some statistics here that, um, that we're sharing in terms of how many vendors we have set up with EFT um, and so forth, and, and the volumes continue to grow. Lastly, Eric, uh, you know, one of the goals also is to move things, if not EFT, to a procurement card where there are considerable benefits to, to paying things on procurement cards with respect to rebates and discounts. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So the final kind of piece here, uh, and, and again, the, this, this probably falls most closely to check reduction costs as well. Um, the, you know, the, the alternative to 
doing ACHEFT if you're trying to reduce those check costs is, you know, how do you push some of your spend now to a credit card? Um, and, and there's a couple of different things, a couple of elements, I think, that you can consider in terms of where your cost savings can be recognized when, um, when you move spend to a credit card. So just before I get there, uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of Mayo's journey over the past five or so years and how we've been able to increase our card usage uh, internally and also um, reduce both our risk in terms of um, you know, using some of the, um, the products that Global Edge has been developing and also driving down the total FTE dedicated to monitoring those types of activities. And so in 2008, and again, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but in 2008 we had uh, quite a few less cards as opposed to 2013. We also had almost one full-time person managing the auditing functions. Now we're down to probably 5 to 10 percent of that total uh, in 2013 thanks to um, some technology that has significantly automated that process for us. And we've not only decreased the total amount of FTE, but we've also gone from a very random spot checking type of, of audit to the audit being very specific around the highest risk activity that we perceive to be on the cards. And, and so that has created a great value to us in being able to reduce our risk and actually looking at, instead of looking at everything as if it were equal, looking at the high, highest risk behaviors first in determining whether or not we had an issue with a cardholder. Okay, so that's kind of the risk reduction piece, but then what about the savings? So the savings really, I, I believe, is grouped into two, maybe three main components. The first one is, just like the previous slide we talked about, what are the cost savings associated with reducing your, your total number of checks being processed? So again, if you reduce your checks in total and you're pushing it to a card, there's automatic savings recognized there right off the bat. So that's, that's probably the easiest one. The second one that a lot of people forget about is when you push spend to a credit card, typically you're receiving some sort of a, a rebate, a small percentage back um, of your total spend. So let's say that that's even just 1%. That's 1% of your total spend that you're getting back in terms of an in cash inflow uh, coming into the organization. So again, um, it's, it's not necessarily cost reduction, but it's certainly a, a cash flow positive to the organization. Uh, so that's to be considered as well. The third one that's a little bit, um, probably less so, but people also commonly forget about is time value of money. And so if you're using credit card products, often your float time is increased and your time value of money is improved internally. Um, and so it's freeing up more cash for your organization. So that is kind of the, the, the final, I guess, piece that we've looked at in terms of uh, actual savings to mail. Barry, can you estimate uh, the overall business impact uh, from, from changing your processes? Um, you know, obviously the root of it was to ensure you're not doing business with uh, false or fake vendors, but uh, today do you have an estimate of what the benefits have been to Mayo Clinic? Yeah, and again, um, going back to the, the, the very the first uh, point around risk, risk mitigation, oftentimes that number isn't known. But if you add all three, you know, the risk mitigation and the check cost P-card program altogether, uh, it's probably somewhere in the 3 to $4 million range, I would guess, um, and, and that may be conservative. Okay. Excellent. That concludes the webinar. Uh, we now can open it up for questions if there are any. All right, well, no questions. So just want to say thank you for attending today, and uh, we appreciate your participation in the webinar. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Global Edge. You can reach us at globaledge.us.